verse from Hebrews 10, you said, if we don't give up, if we don't quit, he that shall come will come. You promise, Lord. And you said in Matthew, if we ask, we'll receive. If we seek, we'll find. If we knock, the door will be open. So I just pray, Lord, that if anyone is struggling this morning and they feel like you're a million miles away, that they would not quit, that they would show the passion to seek you that you showed for us when you died for us. Thank you, Lord, for all you do for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Good to be with you. Turn to Genesis chapter 8. That's where we're going to hang out for a little bit. And uh, got to love the Bible and especially the Psalms and that Psalm 13 where you just have brute honesty from David that says, God, where are you? Have you forgotten me? Because it doesn't seem like you are present. It doesn't seem like you care. And if we're honest, I think we've, we've all been there before as well, right? It's, it's amazing that the Bible holds such passionate, heartfelt truth that sometimes we wonder where, where God is. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. But before we get there, I'm sure all of us have been to a major city or a major event and uh, you are without uh, tr- transportation and you go out to the curb and, and you hope to catch a cab. Right? And have you ever been in that situation where it just doesn't seem like there's a cab or a cab that is available or you've come out of a major event and it uh, seems like there's a long line to wait for a ride and you're just waiting and waiting and waiting? Uh, one of my favorite stories is uh, when my wife and I went to San Francisco to go do something really spiritual, not to see you too in concert. Um, uh, my plan was, well, just after the concert, you know, we'll leave Levi Stadium and just go get an Uber on the corner. Well, that was our idea, along with about 15,000 other people, and uh, she was so mad at me, and the worst part was I had about 2% life left on my phone, and uh, we were about uh, uh, 45 minutes away from our hotel, so it made for an exciting night. It really strengthened our marriage. I, I, I really believe this, so... But, uh, you know, the, that's the amazing thing about Uber, right? You know, you, you, you can go on your phone and be like, okay, how far is the Uber? And, I, you know, I was just thinking, oh, we'll just get an Uber out on the, out on the street. And it said, like, 60-minute away Uber, right? And in, in San Francisco, San Jose, that's like two hours, right? And so, you know, Uber, who's taking Uber? Is everyone ready? Yeah, you've got Uber X, you've got Uber Pool, you've got Uber Chopper. Do you know you can Uber a helicopter? And now there's Uber Buggy. Yeah, they call it Amish Buggy. You know where I'm getting with this? Now, it's not an official connection with the Uber company, but there's a guy in western Michigan who basically you can hail him down and he'll give you a ride on his buggy. And you ride a buggy if you don't want to go anywhere quickly. Amen? Wouldn't that be fun? Like, there you are. And it's like, there's no app. You can't just Uber buggy because it sounds fun. You know, you're just like, hey, Tim. That's the guy's name. Tim, we're down here. Get on the buggy for five minutes, for five bucks, and he'll take you for a little ride on Uber buggy. Does anyone feel like their life is an Uber buggy? We want Uber X. We want Uber Rocket. We need to get where we're going, and we need to get there fast. But how many of us feel like God has us in the Uber buggy right now? Let's be honest. Like, Things aren't moving as fast as they should. And and it's called waiting. And we hate waiting. We hate it. And and just like the, the 20th century prophet Tom Petty sang, the waiting is the hardest part. But then he says, not only is the waiting the, is the hardest part, take it on faith, take it to the heart. The waiting is the hardest part. See, he was on to something there, wasn't he? Don't ask me to do my best Tom Petty. I'll just, I'll just embarrass myself, all right? Genesis 8. We're going to talk about waiting this morning because God has this way with his people, and it's throughout the scriptures, and it's good to know we're in good company that waiting is part of the process that God grows us. He matures us. And it is the hardest part, but there are spiritual principles involved. There are amazing opportunities that await us. And I don't want us to be a people that squander the waiting. That perhaps it's the waiting where God does his best work. And so we are going to talk about Noah this morning and the waiting he had to endure and learn some important lessons 
from this account, Genesis chapter 8. So you guys know what's happened up to this point. God has warned the world through his, his preacher Noah and said judgment's coming and there's going to be a flood and Noah spends 120 years and builds a big boat and then the flood finally comes and Noah and his family and all these animals are on board the boat and this 120 year project uh, finally came to fulfillment. God sends the flood. It totally envelops the earth. And Noah and his family are now inside this barge floating on the water that has covered the earth. And they're in this barge for over a year. And uh, talk about waiting. I mean, 120 years waiting for God's word to come to fulfillment that he's bringing this flood. But now you're in these cramped quarters with your family, with these smelly animals, with a limited supply of food. And now you're just waiting for what? is next and all of us have experienced waiting and and especially when it comes to water i mean how many of us waited for the monsoons to arrive right and finally they hear and then we complain about it right because it's like god we didn't want four days in a row like one good storm would do us my wife and i are laughing at the news the other night because only in phoenix will you spend 15 minutes in the news talking about someone's shingle that fell off their roof we're live in Peoria where there is a homeowner here and a shingle came off their roof. How are you feeling today? We're, we're feeling good. I think we're going to be able to rebuild our lives. And then, All right, let's go to Glendale. And then there's Glendale and there's a tree that falls on a brick, brick fence and one brick's broken. How are you guys managing it? Are you going to be okay? Because we can set up a Red Cross connection for, you know, we turn this, major, this minor thing into a major tragedy. And not to minimize if you've experienced anything more horrific than that, but isn't it funny when it comes to the water, you know, and the monsoons? I mean, they're pretty crazy, aren't they? And, and the Bible wants us to understand that there's, there's a motif that God has with water that he wants us to understand that God uses water and the sea as a picture of disorder and chaos. And when we think about the ocean and we think about the sea and we think about water, there's a lot of uncertainty and fear and dread involved. And God wants us to see. To, to remind us that he's present, even in those chaotic states. And so here we come to Genesis 8. We're going to look at three major points this morning. The first is this, Noah wondered. Number two, Noah waited. And number three, Noah worshipped. And I want you to be encouraged this morning that no matter how slow life may be moving for you and the waiting and the lessons God wants, but you, know, you may be experiencing some tumultuous activity and God wants to remind you that he hasn't disappeared. He's, he's here. He's with you. And so we're going to navigate this together this morning. So let's read the passage in its entirety. And we'll go back and talk about those three points. Noah wondered, he worshipped, and I mean, he waited and he worshipped. Chapter 8, verse 1. But God remembered Noah. Circle those words. What precious, lovely, intimate words these are. Noah God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the cattle that were with him in the ark. And God caused the wind to pass over the earth and the waters subsided. Also, the fountains of the deep and the floodgates of the sky were closed and the rain from the sky was restrained and the water receded steadily from the earth. And at the end of 150 days, the water decreased. And the seventh month of the 17th day of the month, the ark rested upon the mountains of Ararat. And the water decreased steadily until the 10th month. In the 10th month on the first day, the tops of the mountains became visible. And it came about at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. And he sent out a raven. And it flew here and there until the water was dried up from the earth. And then he sent out a dove from him to see if the water was abated from the face of the land. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot. So she returned to him into the ark for the water was on the surface of all the earth. Then he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark to himself. And yet he waited another seven days. And again, he sent out the dove from the ark and the dove came to him toward evening. And behold, in her beak was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the water was abated from the earth. Then he waited another seven days and sent out the dove, but she did not return to him again. Now it came about in the 600, uh, 601st year, in the first month, on the first day of the month, that the water was dried up from the earth. And Noah removed the covering from the ark and looked, and behold, the surface of the ground was dried up. And the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was dry. Then God spoke to Noah, saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. 
Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds and animals and creeping things that creep on the earth, and they may breed abundantly on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. And Noah went out and his sons and his wives and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, every bird, everything that moves on the earth went out by their families from the ark. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took every clean animal of every clean bird and burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled the soothing aroma. And the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man, for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. And I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night, shall not cease. May God bless the reading of his word today. So the place we start is verse 1, chapter 8. God remembers Noah. And I love this this special intimate note here because God has not, at least that we know, said anything to Noah. They're in the ark. There's this major global catastrophic uh, event that's taking place. And wouldn't you like to know what's going on? And how many times Noah is leading his wife and his, his kids and their wives, and, and they're going, what's going on? What's the timetable? What's God up to? And Noah hasn't heard anything from God. It would be quick to think God has forgotten us. Remember, this barge is, is like a coffin. And maybe they're sitting there going, maybe God has pulled a cruel joke on us, and we are going to die in this coffin-like contraption. Noah and the seven others, and all the animals with them, it would be easy to think that God has forsaken us. Have you ever felt in your heart, in your mind, through your experiences, that you have been forsaken? You ever felt like God, he doesn't have a clue, he doesn't even care. He has not shown himself to to be caring towards me or gracious towards me. I mean, I remember as a kid, I went to the movies and, you know, I used to take my, my young girlfriends to, when I was younger, my junior high, you know, when you're living in junior high, you, you don't have a lot of money. So I took them to Shea 14 Theater up at Shea and 32nd Street. That was the discount theater in, in Phoenix, $1.50. So I, I was, you know, I was treating my, my girls to, to, to inexpensive movies. I think we went and saw War Games at least 10 times. Um, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. I always wanted to be Ferris Bueller. And, you know, it's like, no, 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 my treat, $1.50. You know, I was, so, I, was, I was a ladies' man. But, you know, that's another story for another time. But I remember my mom was supposed to pick us up after one of the movies, and my mom forgot. And I was so, and, you know, it wasn't like you just whipped out your smartphone and called mom right up. Guys, this is back in the days where you went to a pay phone, you put this thing called a dime, you dialed the number, and it's like, Mom, what's going on? And I remember she didn't answer. And I'm thinking to myself, it was the worst feeling being this 13-year-old on, his, on this date with this girl that he really, really loves because he met her at the roller skating rink. And you guys did couple skate backwards. And that, it was, there was a connection. You know, you're trying to impress. And, and, you know, Mom has forsaken me. And it didn't look good that the chauffeur hadn't arrived to pick up me and my date. And I just remember being so not only mad at my mom, but I remember being scared because I was like, where's my mom? And I, and I think we feel that way when it comes to God and even more serious things in our lives. God, have you forsaken us? I mean, remember, for Noah, this is not some three-hour tour. This is a long voyage where there's no voice of God telling them what's happening. God never gave them a timetable. And Noah's going, God, have you forgotten us? And so faith is the process of learning to rest and to realize that God can't forget you. I want you to know that when the ark came to rest, according to Genesis 8, this is, this is true for the believer's life, that when God has you, he has you in a place of rest. And he will not forget you. He cannot forget you because that's against his character. I'm going to tell you something, you guys. God remembers, and what that remembering means is that there is continual movement towards the object that he's promised mercy and grace and love to. There is active movement from God, and when he remembers, it's not just 
coming to memory like he forgot. God doesn't forget. But it is a movement to say to you, I will come through on my promises for you. And so the first point is this when it comes to God. He remembers his people. Or if you want to put a little more endearing term in there, he remembers his children. He is a good father and he never forgets his promises. But more importantly, ladies and gentlemen, you need to understand that he is true to his character. It is God's character that gives us the assurance that he'll never forget us. So I want you to write down a, a, a few words. I want you to write down these words. Love, faithfulness. Here's a big one. Immutable means he never changes. He's immutable. He's perfect. And then write down holy. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to see these five words. And I want these five characteristics of God to grow in your life. God is love. And where there's love, there's faithfulness. And where there's faithfulness, there's this unchanging nature, his immutability. He never changes. And because he never changes, that must mean he is perfect. And if he's perfect, he cannot get any better. And tying it all together is his holiness, which means he can't change for the worse. Think about these five things that are so true of God, and he reminds us as his people, as his children, that he wants to prove these things to you over and over and over again. And that God knows you and he celebrates you. Heaven celebrates you. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. You are the one whom Jesus died for. And go ahead and insert your name in the Hall of Faith chapter in Hebrews chapter 11 where it not only lists specific names of people like Abraham and, and Moses and David, but it even gives you general things that people did that are often unnamed. And I think sometimes we feel like, who knows me? Who celebrates me? Who recognizes me? We live in a world where there's just flash in the pan celebrity and we feel like, you know, oh, I didn't get that many clicks on my, you know, it's too many likes on my Facebook or I don't have any followers on my, my Twitter account. I must be a failure. And God says, let me tell you something. According to Hebrews 11, if you have Christ, you are men and women of whom the world is not worthy. If you have Christ, it doesn't matter if you have one subscriber to your YouTube channel or 10 million subscribers to your YouTube channel. Amen? You are known by God. You are his child. And he says to you, the world may forget you. The world may not appreciate you. But you are people of whom this world is not worthy. I know you. And I will love you for eternity. He remembers us. And to hear him say one day when we meet him face to face, well done, good and faithful servant, will be the greatest top off of our experience in this world to realize that none of it was going to go to waste. God is going to leverage it all for his glory. And so know this, that God remembers us because you are people of whom the world is not worthy. But on the other hand, there's something we need to continue to do to remember we are not forgotten. And you know what we do? We remember the gospel. There is no magic pill. There's no magic formula. I'm not going to give you some chants and some mantras and say, do the downward dog position and hope the feelings come back to you. This is not about feeling. This is not about, this is about objective truth and there's no greater objective truth than the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. You need to be reminded that God loves you. You need to be reminded that God sent his son to die for you. We need to know that it is not our nature to remember God. We are a forgetful people. It is not in our nature to remember God's goodness, how quickly we forget how good God is. We need to remember that we have a tendency to forget God. And when things get difficult or confusing or complicated, we need to remember the gospel because nothing anchors the crazy, fleeting, fickle heart like the gospel. It is the gospel that is our anchor. And if you need a reminder of how much God loves you and that he remembers you, look to the cross of Christ. And ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't get any more simple than that. That you remember the gospel of Christ. There was a 20th century theologian that wrote volumes and volumes of books 
He was invited to speak all around the world. This guy knew all the ancient languages. This guy knew scripture. And he was poised with the question, of all the theological truths you've studied your entire life, what is the most important? And this 80-year-old theologian who's written all these books, who will go down in the annals of history as being one of the greatest theologians ever, said these words. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Guys, don't complicate this. Right? It's like, I'm not asking you to, to learn Hebrew or Greek and, and memorize 50 million Bible verses if there were that many. All I'm going to say is, here's a man at the end of his life that says there's one thing that has anchored my heart, and that is this. Jesus loves me. This I know. Why? Because my heart tells me? No. Because I'm feeling it right now? No. We are all emotional train wrecks. Let's just admit it. But why does Jesus love us? Because the Bible tells us so. There is an event that happened 2,000 years ago at this place called Golgotha, also known as the Skull, where there is a Savior who laid his life down for you. Doggone it, don't tell me God has forgotten you. Remind yourself of that truth, amen? So we wonder. Like Noah, where's God? What's he up to? He's doing something. And this is why this next point is so important. Noah waited. And the waiting is hard because we live in the, the age of impatience. I'm going to call this the age of impatience. We live in a culture, we live in a society that whether we're waiting in line, waiting in traffic, waiting for food service, waiting for marriage, waiting for that perfect job, we're just biding our time. And while we bide our time, it just seems so countercultural as ever. We've been conditioned to have it our way, right away, right now. And fast food and instant coffee have really ruined it for us. And let me just add Amazon to the equation. Can I just tell you, my, my kids have grown up in the Amazon age. And, you know, they'll, they'll want me to order something for them on Amazon. And literally, you know, and I love how persistent my kids are, but sometimes I hate it too. You know, they'll say, Dad, did you order me that thing? And literally, they just told me about it five minutes ago. Like, all of a sudden, I'm just supposed to whip out my smartphone and go, whatever you want, I'll order it right now. And then I'll tell them I ordered it. And like two hours later, they'll go, did it arrive yet? <laughs> I mean, I lived in the day where, you know, if I wanted like a, a, a cassette tape, and I'd save the box tops, and I'd have to mail it in, and then it took four to six weeks for it to get to me, and I was okay with that. But my kids are like, did it come yet? Did it come yet? Did it arrive yet? Did it arrive yet? And the dog starts barking. They're like, oh, FedEx is here. Oh, dog starts barking. Oh, UPS is here. It's got to be this. It's got to be this. Simmer down, kids. We act as if God is also like this am spiritual Amazon service. Right? Like, we just come to him and order whatever we want, and hopefully we'll get it, like, promptly, and... God doesn't work like that. God does not operate in the age of impatience, basically coalescing to our every whim, and desire, and wish. You know how God works? He works in three ways in giving us answers to our prayers and, and, and seeing the longings of our hearts. He either says yes, he either says no, or he either says wait. And you know, we're good with yes. When God says yes, we're like, we're good with this. We've got what we want. We got what we desired. We love when God says yes. My kids hate it because I'm not the yes guy. Mom's the yes guy in our house. But I'm not the yes. They'll, they'll go to mom and be like, mom, can we do this? And they know like 80 to 90% she's going to say yes. But if they come to dad, they know it's a 10 to 20% chance. They're, and, and now the conversation is like this. Dad, we have something to ask you, but we know you're going to say no. Like that, I'm that guy. And you know what? Even no is something, but it's the wait. It's like the not now, but maybe later that drives them crazy, right? At least yes is concrete. No is concrete. Maybe it's just kind of this floating in the air, like where's this thing going to land kind of spot? And we hate that when it comes to God because he sometimes says, wait. And it is our proclivities, it is our nature that has a hard time accepting that. 
Here's Noah in the boat. It's been over a year. The waters have ceased. New life is apparent. I mean, Noah does not even step a foot until God tells him to step out. Did you notice that? I mean, think about this. Can you imagine? Here they are. They can't wait to stretch their arms. They can't wait to just not see another person. I mean, you love your family, but not for a year plus being in the same solitary confinement together. Amen? And here they are, the animals, the attitudes, everything, and they can't wait to disembark. It's, it's kind of like the airplane that lands, and what does the flight attendant say? You know, even though it's on the ground, they say, please remain seated until we get to the, everyone pops up, right? As soon as that ground, it hits ground, like everyone's up getting their luggage out, like no one cares what the flight attendant wants. I mean, as soon as this boat rests, I can just imagine like, all right, let's get going. Got places to go, people to meet, and God's like, no, stay seated, stay seated. I mean, think about this. He displayed obedience when commanded by God to build the boat. He displayed faith when he waited for God to, to say, get on the boat. I mean, he even gathers data. You wonder what the bird thinks all about? Ravens and doves, like what? He's gathering data. And even in gathering data, he still doesn't do what he thinks is right. He waits for God to give him the clue. Can you write down this verse, Proverbs chapter 3? I'm going to tell you right now, this verse is going to save you a lot of headache and heartache. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he's going to make straight your paths. This is so key to our lives, you guys. Because there's a way that seems right to us. And the Bible says it leads to destruction. We have yet to wait and learn to what it means to wait on God. And God says to us, you can afford to wait. Write this down, you ready? Tweet moment of the morning. You can afford to wait because God is with you. We are so preoccupied with all the stuff and things we want or things we want to pursue. And yet God says you can wait because you have the greatest thing you could ever want or need, and that's me. That's why I think Noah was, was fine with just waiting until God said, go. See, first point is this. God's commands require obedience, and God has commanded Noah all, all throughout this account. And Noah has obeyed. But here's the second point. God's cues require faith. And what I mean by cues are those things that he does by means of his spirit as he prompts you to take a step, to take a breath, to blink an eye, to lift a hand. We are called as people of Christ to be people of the spirit. And the Bible says we are to walk according to the Spirit. Now, can I get totally esoteric and mystical on you guys? This is something that is better caught than taught. When you are called to live by the Spirit, there is a spiritual sensitivity. There are spiritual antennae that go up that you say, I am not going to do anything until I clearly hear the voice of God tell me to do this. Now, I'm not promising you're going to hear an audible voice. As a matter of fact, I don't think God speaks in audible voices. That's probably the chili you had last night for dinner. Amen? But what I do believe is that God uses three things to cue you in how to live. His word, his spirit, and his people. And we need to do better in taking our cues from God because many of us have made decisions we could say, oh, this was of God, and they really weren't. And we have suffered the consequences because we leaned on our understanding. We didn't trust God, and the path is not straight, and it seems to be destructive. And we want to talk it up to God, and maybe, you know, maybe he was wrong. And No, 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 it was your heart that was amiss. It was you justifying whatever choice you wanted to do. And, 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 and let's just be straight up with each other. Let's just be honest with each other. 
we have a hard time waiting. And waiting is not, write down these two words, impetuous and waiting is not despairing. Here's, here's two ends of the spectrum. It is not impetuous where, you know what, we've got a plan. We're stomping our feet. God knows us stomping our feet. We may not be physically stomping our feet, but inside we're anxious. And it's like, God, you're not on my ta- timetable, so therefore I'm going to go ahead and make a decision. And we're impetuous. And that is not taking a cue from God when you want your way no matter what. I say Yahweh, you go, no, 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 no way. My way. So it's not impetuous. And waiting is not despairing. So we don't go ahead and and find ways to accomplish what we want to happen, but neither are we despairing where we can't control where our emotions take us and we often let our heart take over and it's nothing but brutal on us. You're forsaken, you're forgotten, God doesn't love you and we're despairing and that's why waiting can cause so much fear and dread and anxiety because of all these uncertainties and I want you to know that's not taking a cue from God. If your waiting is filled with impetuous decisions or despairing heart, that's not biblical waiting. What is biblical waiting? Two words, patience and hoping. I love what John Piper said. He said this, waiting on the Lord is the opposite of running ahead of the Lord. And it's the opposite of bailing out on the Lord. It's staying at your appointed place while he says stay, or it's going at his appointed pace while he says go. He's either saying stay, or he's either saying go. And the Lord is the one who dictates it all. So worship is patience. Ladies and gentlemen, 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. Love is patient. But not only that, one of the fruit of the Spirit is patience. Galatians chapter 5. Let me give you this verse, Romans chapter 8. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. And, and let me just tell you, in context of Romans 8, there's an eagerness for something. But, but Paul says, keep that eagerness at bay and wait. Take your cues from God. And this is what God's children need, right? In the moments of waiting, perhaps that's where the greatest spiritual maturity happens. We are men and women of action. We are men and women of results. We are men and women of accomplishments. And yet, I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to go out on a limb on this one, I'm going to tell you perhaps the greatest spiritual growth happens when you aren't doing anything. And it's God who says, press into me. And know who I am, remember what I've done, and lean on my promises. Amen? Because trust me, in the age of impatience, this is not an easy thing to do, yet we need to be a self-controlled people. We want what we want, and we're going to get what we want when we want it, and that's not God's way. And whether we're talking about a marriage that'd be just so nice to bail on or a job when we don't have anything lined up, but boy, I just don't like where I'm at or where I live or the friends I have or the children I'm raising. We just have all this stuff that we're just going to like, like, we're just going to throw in the towel and walk away and God's going, what, what are you doing? You're doing what you want, but you're not taking your cues from me. And so we must be patient. And 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 let's just be honest, sometimes it feels like the waiting is God's withholding. And he's reminding you that your hope is not in what you may get or what you may experience or the next chapter. Your hope is not in situations and circumstances. Your hope is in a person, and that person is God. Because there's nothing you're waiting for that's more important than him. Amen?
which is why waiting is hoping. It's not just patience and saying, God, I will stay here and calmly, peacefully accept where I'm at, but it's also saying to God, I will not hope in what I think I'm going to get or what I think I deserve or the change of circumstance that I'm hoping is going to happen. No, no. Patience is hoping in God because the things we're waiting on God for are often, often things that are things we deeply desire, but we become so preoccupied with them, they take the place of God, and in a word, that's idolatry. And there's one thing I know that God doesn't want to do in our waiting is create idol-loving people. What God does in the waiting is he says, hope in me. I mean, John, isn't that the Psalm 13, right? God, where are you? <laughs> Have you forgotten me? I'm still here. I'm trusting you, but I'm, it's hard. And at the end of the, the Psalm, he says, I will put my trust in God. And yet many of us are trusting in some sort of process, some sort of human-fueled endeavor, achievement. We put our faith in stuff, and you know what stuff does? It fails us. Think about it, and I've said this before, and I think it's worth saying again. The reason there is so much disorder and chaos in our lives and in our world is that the idols are failing people all around us. We have created for ourselves idols. And God has yet to reign supreme in the hearts of those that say they love him. How we wait is shaping the people we are becoming. How are you waiting right now? Because God does oftentimes his best work in the waiting. You guys know about our story of trying to have kids? nine plus years of dealing with infertility. Here's what we did not do. We didn't lock ourselves in our home and just commiserate with one another in our cesspool of wallowing and sadness. <laughs> God, I'm not going to move until you bless us. You know we want kids. And we were just like, you know, we weren't spiritual big thumb sucking babies. We hurt because of the fact we wanted children. But you know what we did? We made the use of the time that God had given us not to wallow, but to worship. You don't have what you want, and some people turn into big, thumb-sucking crybabies. And God says, stop. Let me put a new, fresh diaper on you, and the only thing I want you to do now, I want you to worship me. I want you to work with for me. I want you to walk with me. I want you to do anything but go and crawl into your fetal position and just act as if you deserve it all because you don't. But the fact that I love you through Jesus, that ought to be enough. Get on up and get your ass busy for me, right? The very thing we don't do, we ought to do. When you are waiting, you ought to worship. When you are waiting, you ought to work. When you are waiting, you ought to walk. And there is no thing as immobility when it comes to the kingdom of Christ. Keep yourself busy. Let God direct your steps and be happy and content with where he has you. And worship is essential to the weight because it's in those moments he's cultivating patience and hope. Romans chapter 5, verses 2 through 5. Check this out. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings because sometimes waiting feels like suffering, right? Now check this out. Knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character, character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts of the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. What are you bickering about? Let God do this work of making you into the image of Jesus Christ. This is the process. And whether you, you're like, well, I don't like 
uh, the Apostle Paul. Go ahead and write 2 Peter chapter 1. Let's see if you like Peter. Because Peter's got the same words. I don't have it up here, but this is homework for you. Because Peter recites the same process. That while we are waiting and we find ourselves in circumstances we don't like, we don't dare step foot without the Spirit giving us the cue that leads in this process of your spiritual growth. And I'm not up here telling you this is easy. But I'm going to tell you it is needed. Right now, we as a church are praying about the future of what does God want us to do with the people and the treasure and the money and all the stuff that God's blessed us with. And we're, we're talking about Missio Day 2 and Sozo 2 someplace else. And we're praying. And we've got people that are really, really, we, we're praying about God directing our steps. But you know what? I don't feel this compulsion inside that we've got to act on the first thing. Like God is showing us as church leadership. We were just talking about this past Wednesday night. God, we know you want us to do this, but we're going to look to you as far as the when and where and how. The why has already been answered because there's people that need to know Jesus through a model of church planting like this, which is fun. And you guys are all participants in that. And as we continue to go before the Lord, our hope is not in the perfect location. Our hope is not in the perfect team. Our hope is in God who says, I want to see the kingdom advance and more women and children and men knowing Jesus. That's what's important. So our hope is saying, God, we want to be spiritually taking our cues from you. And you need to continue to pray for us. Because guess what? This is actually moving closer and closer to some more specifics that I'm going to share with you now, but God's doing something. So the day when we say, guess what? We've got a team and we've got a location. We're going to do this again in another place of the valley so that more men and women and children can know Jesus. We're all going to be like, giddy up! Let's make this thing happen. But we'll know it's from God and not from some impetuous leader like me because sometimes I can be impetuous. But I'm not despairing. You know why? Because Jesus said, the, the, I will grow my church and the gates of hell shall not stand against it. There's still people that need to know Jesus, and we get to be a part of that. Paul David Tripp said this, Waiting is not just about what I get at the end of the wait, but about who I become as I wait. Hashtag tweet. Habakkuk chapter 3, because we haven't had enough minor prophets. Listen to the words. And these are some of the most rich words you'll find in the Old Testament. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor the fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the Lord, the God of my salvation, God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the hot deers. He makes me tread on high places to the choir master with stringed instruments. You got, always got to thank the choir master. Don't forget that. But notice, one thing that he wished were different. Boy, I wish there was blossom on the trees, and I wish there were olives in the fields, and I wish there was grapes on the, on the clusters, and I wish there were sheep in the, in the fold, and I wish there were animals. In the, but he says, I've got nothing yet. I've got God. And the man or woman who has God has more than the man or woman who has not God yet has everything. Psalm 27. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. And where does our heart take courage? In all the circumstances that work out according to the way we wish and desire? No, 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 no. Your courage is not in people or circumstances. Your courage is in God. So root yourself in Him. Don't be impetuous and don't be despairing, yet exercise great patience and hope as God continues to refine your faith. Last point. So you know what Noah does at the end of all this? He worships. So he wondered, God, are you there? 
Are you working? Are you doing something? Like, I, I just could use a word. And he waits, and God finally says, Noah, you and your family can step out of the boat. The conditions are ready for you. And Noah, as soon as he steps on dry land, his first act is to worship God. And can I just tell you that every single one of us who know Jesus Christ can always make that our first action to worship him. Maybe that moment you turn and get out of bed and your feet hit the ground and go, okay, I'm alive today. God, I'm going to worship you. We sit in our car and it starts up. Okay, I'm going to worship God. The moment you walk into work and you think your boss is going to be a total jerk and he or she's actually nice to you, you sit there and go, yeah, I'm going to worship God, no matter what. Like, can we turn every thing into a moment of worshiping God? We ought to. Because is God worthy of our worship? Yeah. So look what Noah does. He builds an altar and he offers sacrifice to the Lord. I mean, remember, he boarded the boat with sacrificial animals. I mean, that is a walk of faith right there. And yet his first act is to worship God. And can I tell you now, you know, Noah is not just a boat builder. He can add that to his resume. Now he's an altar builder. And his first response is one of gratitude. Are you thankful today? Because I know a lot of people who say they know Jesus and there is just a thankless spirit within them. Are you, can you honestly say right now here before your God, I am thankful, God. I'm thankful for the rain and I'm thankful for the, the drought. I'm thankful for the famine. I'm thankful for the feasts. I'm thankful for the clusters that are filled with grapes. And I'm thankful for the dry, barren vineyard. But God, no matter what, I'm not going to allow circumstances to dictate my gratitude. I'm thankful. And thankfulness is the engine behind worship. And there's two things we need to talk about when it comes to worship. We'll close with this. There's the conviction of the heart and there's the cost of the sacrifice. It's interesting that God says, after Noah worships, he says, I'm not going to destroy the earth again. Even though man's heart is still continually evil. Remember what I said a couple weeks ago? The flood doesn't change. The, it changed the earth. And it communicated a very strong message, but it didn't change hearts. Only God can change the heart, and that change comes through the personal work of Jesus Christ. But what God does is he has seen Noah's righteousness, but now based on this sacrifice of Noah, he promises to never again destroy the earth in spite of humanity's sin because now there's a worshiping community. And he's going, I know this will continue. Will all people worship God? Nope. But will there be a remnant who do worship God? Yes. But what's the key in worshiping God? It is the conviction of the heart, like I said. Knowing that deep down inside what God has done for me is going to now result in a response that says, I'm convicted to give him everything. Which is the cost. And if he gave you his son, who was rich yet became poor for your sake so that through his poverty you might become rich? What's God asking you to give him? And, I, and this is not turning into a giving message like, oh no, here comes the big sell. Pass the plate. Let's get that offering going. No, 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 no. Part of us showing how much gratitude we have towards God is giving money. But more than money, God wants your life. So the question is this, are you willing to live your life for the glory of God? And it's easy to do for an hour and a half on Sunday. It's a whole lot more difficult when you get to that workplace tomorrow morning and you're confronted with, let's see how well you play Jesus now in this environment. Or you go home to a spouse that may not be kind or patient or loving toward you. Will you worship God in that moment and give your life for someone that you say they don't deserve it? Well, what made you so deserving of God's love? That's my favorite. When I talk to couples all the time, like, they don't deserve it. And I sit there and go, can I just bring in the gospel into this conversation right now? 
because we act as if we're deserving people, and guess what? We're not. So now take that gospel message, and whether it be with your spouse or with your kids or with your coworkers, you go out and you, you it is costly. It is costly to show grace in ungracious environments. But that's the spirit of Christ that needs to reside in the hearts of his people. So think about what God has done for you. May that erupt into a heart of gratitude. And may you realize that no matter where you go, the cost of glorifying God and exalting Christ is never too inexpensive a price to pay for what God has done for you. Amen. My prayer is that there was a word for you this morning. And more importantly than a word, the word, Christ, is made all the more important because there's nothing without him. Amen. For he is the way, the truth, and the life. And all of our joy and all of our hope is rooted in who he is. And all I know is today that he is magnificent. He is awesome. He is wonderful. And boy, we ought to exalt in him because of what he's done for us. Let's stand, let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning and a chance for your people to gather and to sing and to hang out and love on each other and to go to your word. And Father, to, to be reminded of, 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 of the topic that is so near to all of our experiences. And Lord, whether we've been through seasons of waiting and we're not there now, or whether we are in those seasons now, my prayer is that we would understand a little bit more clearly today what your desire is for us in those moments. Lord, forgive us for being those kids that are kicking and screaming and just want what we want. And restore to us a, a, a patient and hopeful heart that says, God, no matter what, we have you and we will wait for your cue. Trusting you to make true and sure on your promises. And Lord, I can't help but be reminded of Romans 8. If you, God, gave us your son, how will you not also give us all other things for us to live? And so we trust that word and we trust that promise. And more importantly, Father, we trust you. Thank you for the grace and mercy and love you've shown us in Christ. Now we, may we live as a people who are so thankful for what you've done for us. And we pray this all in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Have a great day, you guys. We'll see you soon, all right? Bye-bye. Hey, thanks for watching the video. We uh, hope you've been blessed and encouraged by, uh, by watching it. Stay tuned for future videos. Uh, if you're ever in the Phoenix area, we'd love for you to join us in person at Sozo Coffee. We're at Warner and Alma School. Two services every Sunday, 9 and 1045. Check out the churchisaverb.org for more information. Have a great week. We'll see you soon.